Hi guys, how's it going? My name is Josh Halter. I am owner and founder of The BioDude. I'm here in my uh, retail store, The BioDude Houston. You can come visit me Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. as well as visit my website, thebiodude.com and follow us on social media. It's been a bit, guys. Uh, been getting my butt kicked, but we've been doing really well, especially with the pre-recession and all the other stuff but I'm really excited to do this video because I did one of these a couple years ago but a lot has changed in our community um, there's been a lot of innovative products and things and I really wanted to showcase some of those things uh, that goes with this I'm gonna build a 40 breeder this is an exoterra 36 18 18 le leopard gecko terrarium um, we're gonna you know use our cleanup crew and our and our micro eyes eye and all that stuff and i'm gonna go over with you i love leopard geckos they are one of the best starter reptiles uh, in my opinion that you can have this is one of my captive bred younger specimens that we have available here at our point of sale and this is you know you know your normal yellow morph so leopard geckos go through a color change as they get as they get older they end up losing their bands and end up getting spots like a leopard depending on the morph that you have these guys are from the middle east like afghanistan pakistan and they are crepuscular which means they're only out during the dusk and dawn is when you're going to see them foraging for for food and things like that. When you're buying and trying to find a new leopard gecko, there's a couple things that you wanna look for. Number one, if you look at all the toes here, there should be a total of five toes on each uh, foot. Leopard geckos, uh, when they have bad sheds, sometimes shed can get stuck and then it can uh, make their toes fall off from the consistent pressure of the dead skin. You also wanna look at their eyes to make sure that we don't have sunken eyes. Uh, a lot of times if they're dehydrated, you can literally, you'll literally look like they have ra uh, ra raccoon eyes. And then the last thing you want to look for when doing a health check is their tail. Um, obviously, they can regrow their tails, being eyelided geckos. But you also want to look at how thick the tail is. What you don't want is a tail that's thinner at, at this second, se or sorry, this uh, tenth segment here, that's thinner than the back end of the body. If it's thinner than that, that means we've been really utilizing our fat reserves, and that could mean that we're being underfed or a couple other things. So I'm not a veterinarian, but those are just things that you wanna look for when, when, when selecting them. But again, I can't stress how awesome these guys are. They're great pets for kids, and they're great for getting uh, younger audiences and older audiences alike into the joy of keeping reptiles as pets. Um, so, like I said, I want to give you guys a brief overview. So, what's really great about, so we ended up getting uh, our, our LEDs in finally. Uh, and it's great because we ordered them in November and we just got them and it's the end of April. Gotta love overseas shipping, guys. It has been fun. So, and of course, I have all of our other husbandry stuff here. I have UVB, heat, thermostats. I'm going to go over all that. But I honestly just want to build. That's what I'm most excited for. So, let's get building. So I got my Terra Sahara. You guys are fully aware of that substrate. I've been using it now for years. Uh, this is approximately 36 quarts right here. So this is ex exactly 36 quarts of substrate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my substrate and I'm just gonna dump it right in here. So a 36 quart bag should approximately give you this much of a floor print when utilizing a 40 breeder. Um, with when it comes to how much you actually get out of the bag. So we try to be as aggressive as possible with putting as much in here because we know that reptiles love to dig and it's good to have a lot of soil when you're using a bioactive substrate. Minimum of three, a minimum of three inches of depth, guys, is what I recommend. So you can see right here, um, pushing this down. So we got a really solid, I'd say about four and a half inches here, a little bit lower in the back, which I'm gonna even out. Uh, this is a really good starting point. So the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start adding in my soil inoculants and my biodegradables. So you guys know uh, we do offer my BioShot. So essentially all you do, this is our new packaging, 
and we also made it a lot better. Um, so I've been really focusing on my current products and really upping, uh, uh, trying to up my packaging as well as consistently not have our quality uh, remain that high, which is what my customers are so so uh, used to. So I added my BioShot, and we are going to be using obviously Detrivores, so Springtails Isopods. So to kind of help the plants out as well as to help the bugs, or excuse me, the cleanup crew, not bugs, I'm gonna add in a little bit of calcium into this soil as well. And that will also help some of the desert plants. So this is my Soil Cow Plus right here. Okay, now again, you don't have to do this. I'm just really trying to jumpstart my substrate as much as possible, um, you know, so to, to give me a bed, the best chance of success. So after I get my inoculants in, the next thing I'm gonna do is start adding in my other biodegradables. So the one thing that you are gonna start receiving in your kits for your Terra Sahara kits, if you do buy a kit from me, is uh, palm bark. Now, I've had this product forever. You can also use the, 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 instead of the fronds, but this is the actual bark pieces. It's just, the palm down here has very sharp pieces to it, and I just, there's too much labor going into cutting the jagged edges off for me to be able to scalably sell the product. So, we decided to use the fronds and use it in our own isopod cultures, and we've had a lot of success with it. So, I am just gonna take some of the palm bark here, or the fronds, excuse me. And I'm just gonna put a little bit of layer right on the top. Nothing too crazy. I still have a good amount left in the bag. And that's okay, because you can add more later. The next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use some of my sphagnum moss. Now, this is something you're really gonna wanna play with because every state's different. So if you're in Pennsylvania, you're gonna need to use more spag in your mixture to keep your humidity where you want it. Whereas down here in Texas, especially in Houston where it's really humid, you don't need near as much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this bag and we got new labels. I've been working hard. This is the, the Ch Chilean. So we swap out between the New Zealand and the Chilean just because um, it's so it's harder to get. So we want to make sure we're accurately representing what you guys are buying. Again, I'm just I've been working really hard in fixing my packaging and some other things um, to make it more just better. Okay, so I'm going to take this, I'm going to cut it, and I'm just going to put in some water here into this Chilean sphagnum moss. And I'm going to take this bag, I'm going to fold it right like this. You can also do this to your six quart substrate bags if you need to pre-wet it. You fold it, you shake it up right like that, see how this is nice and absorbed? So we're not going to need a ton of spag in here because we are going, because we are in Texas. Um, you want the spag to be wet, but not really dripping like crazy, okay? So, and we all know that leopard geckos like to have a cool side and a hot side, as well as varying humidity levels throughout. Um, one thing you don't want to do with the spag moss is leave it on top of your substrate, meaning you don't want to cover all of your substrate with the moss, because that'll uh, affect how water is being passed from point A to point B. You want to make sure in your soil depth you really want to make sure that you are uh, accurately and thoroughly mixing your spag moss and understanding where you want your humid high or where you want your hot spot to be so you can concentrate a little bit more spag over there uh, to create a more of a humid sauna for them. And that's going to be right back there. So, so I used about, okay, I used about two, two, two thirds of the bag, nothing crazy. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do, you can see I got the spag, the palms, uh, the soil cow plus, and the bio shot. Next, I'm going to take my leaf litter. So now in the kits, we offer multiple sizes. Let me tell you, leaves are really hard to scale, guys, but we're doing great. So we offer the two quarts. So anything under 40 breeder, you'll get about this size of leaves. Uh, and then anything at 40 breeder or more, you'll, you'll, you'll get the larger bag. It's a six quart. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use about half. Okay, I need a little bit more. So um, we all know that there's really not a lot of leaves in the desert, okay? And there's not really moss in the desert. However, what we're just trying to do is accurately mimic their natural environment as closely as possible while reinforcing just the natural biological processes that are going to happen anyway, okay? Um, and that's why the BioShot and Soil Cal Plus is there. So we have our leaf litter. 
our triple A spag moss, uh, as well as some palm prawns in here, mixed into the Terra Sahara with some Bioshot and Soil Cal Plus. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna thoroughly mix everything together. Took my ring off so we don't have a, another episode of living treasures when my ring, my wedding ring got into a bag of soil or into a tank and we have to go through and figure out which tank it was. That was a, that was something else. Okay, so we're gonna, this is all nice and mixed together. Okay, and I like to make sure that, that my palm fronds are buried because what's gonna happen is moisture is gonna be absorbed by these and they're gonna create little microbial hot spots in your soil, which trust me is super, super beneficial. Now that we see that everything is mixed together and there's, uh, you know, there's not just a single layer on top, the this, this substrate can breathe, what you're gonna want to do is you know just just to make sure your soil level is where you want it to be i am happy with this soil level with what i'm doing so what i'm going to do next is start my artscape so what i know is that i want to give this little guy a couple areas to sleep people say leopard geckos don't bask i've seen them bask especially when the sun's uh starting to go down um where the rocks absorb the heat throughout the day so I'm going to be doing my flat hide method halfway buried into the soil, which again, I really can't emphasize how important it is to thoroughly maintain your humidity because we know it's shedding, respiration, and hydration are one of the most three pivotal things when it comes to proper husbandry with keeping reptiles. So I got this really, really nice cork, cork bark tube right here. Um, I really like this because I feel like what this is going to do is give us a couple areas to come in and out of. So I, and I want this on the cooler side. So I think I'm gonna put this like right here, right like this. And it's gonna leave me some uh, spot in the back for the, boom, for the cacti. So we have a little area that we can come out right here. So this is gonna be the cooler end of the hide. So I'm expecting the humidity in this hide to stay around 30% to 30 to 40%. Um, and around 80 to 82, 83 degrees during the day, and as low as 70 degrees at night. And then during the, uh, during the, for the hot end, I'm gonna create uh, some, some, some cork bark areas that go deep into the soil, like so. And then I'm gonna partially bury it under the soil, like so. So you guys know I'm all for opportunity giving them multiple opportunity zones to be able to work. What I am going to do, however, is I'm going to add in, for me, because of my building style, a little bit more substrate. And I'm doing this because I want to really make sure that these have really nice humidity ranges, as well as a basking spot. To me, that's very important, because again, we're all about opportunities. For reptiles. The more opportunities you have, the better off they will do. And it still makes them accessible to you. Okay, perfect. So we got a little bit of range here. Now, as you know, the springtails and isopods, the hot spot's gonna be up here, so they might not tend to stay, they might stay away from this area more so than like here and here. So there might be some spot cleaning for you that you're gonna need to regulate here depending on how your cleanup crew advances with the hotspot, which the only one that's gonna know that is you. So what I can do though, is give them a reason to come and put a little bit more leaves on here. Okay, so I did end up using my full bag as I wanted, perfect. So I got a couple areas to hide here, as well as different, we can climb up high to do our thing. And then we have some of our humid hides right in here with the spag moss thoroughly mixed more heavily into these areas. So this side, I expect the humidity under here to be between, uh, I would say between 55 and 85 to almost 90% varying throughout the day, depending on how we're misting. Uh, and then on the top here, a nice hot spot of around 90 to 95 degrees, uh, 95 being pretty hot, 
uh, within here with the temperatures probably reaching low 90s to mid 80s. So lots of different ranges for them to thermoregulate. So to maintain that, I recommend using a thermometer hygrometer. So this, this is my thermometer hygrometer that I manufacture. The probe's nice because you can open it up and you, and you can put the probe uh, really wherever. So let's do that. All right. And then there's the battery right in here. And then once we get the battery in, we just turn it on and then we put the probe anywhere we want. And what's nice is this cord fits in the back of the holes in the exoterra for the other stuff. And then you can just seal it shut and then move the cord wherever you want it. You just want to make sure you don't put it directly under the heat for a long time, especially if it's a spot ball because you don't want to melt the plastic. Food for thought. Okay, so I really like this hardscape. However, I think there's one more thing that I want to do for that hardscape. And I got a piece of, piece of uh, ghost wood right here. So when selecting branches like this, you don't want it to be too thin that can't fit their little bodies onto. That's really important. So I'm gonna put this right here. Well, first, that can go like that, perfect. So what I wanna put up here, obviously I don't want this to be completely bare, but what you put under here has to be able to handle a light, like at all times. So it really can't get cooked. I really can't think of something better than an agave. So this is a spaghetti agave. This is a really popular plant for people use for herbivores and omnivores. So, um, so we rinsed all of these plants before we put them in here. Um, I am gonna be doing another video soon on how to de-dirt your plants and how to safely clean your plants before putting them in your terrarium. Because, uh, you know, we do everything we can to make sure that there's never anything else in there, but there's only so much that you can do. So, you know, pretty good, all right? All right, then we're gonna take this. And I'm gonna put this right here. I want to make sure that the root systems are completely nice and covered. Perfect. I like that. I'm going to take this, put that right there, right like that. I'm going to take this. So if you're wondering what this is, these are, this is my Oklahoma, Texas Creek, Creek rock that we sell by the pound. I love this stuff. We ship it by the case. It's uh, one of my favorites. Then we need, I need something. I need something for right here. That's gonna be able to handle a little bit of heat, but nothing too crazy, but while just popping. Big ol' aloe vera. Okay. Man, this one's almost, it's a good thing I got it out of this pot. The roots were becoming unhappy. A lot of, a lot of large roots. And this is my cacti right here. It's in a pontia. I'm gonna put it right back here. This is another good plant that you can like use and have it have access to the heat without, you know, becoming too of a, too much. Okay. okay. All right. I dig it. So I'm liking what we have so far, but the next thing I really need to figure out is uh, how accessible are my water bowl and my calcium bowl. And if you rotate out your calcium bowl with a feeding bowl, like when you're feeding roaches and things like that. So I got the Fluker's Repta Bowl right here. This is the medium one. This is probably one of our top selling water bowls. Uh, I, I really like it. it. Looks good. It's clean. Okay, and so this is what I'm going to use for the water. So when I'm at, and now I like this location right here. It's away from the hot spot. It's easily accessible, and I can clean it up. We've got a water bowl. Next comes the feeding bowl or the calcium dish. So some people like to offer a calcium dish. I do just because I think it, they, they'll benefit from it. And I like having it in view. So that way I can make sure it's staying clean like my water. So I'm actually gonna put that like right around right here. 
All right, so I'm gonna keep on planting. So I got some really beautiful cryptanthuses. This is a cryptanthus Elaine. Very, very popular cryptanthus that we sell. Very easy to grow. Um, doesn't, it really doesn't need a lot, which is great. And what I am gonna do is I'm actually gonna do this one a little bit different. I'm gonna take a little bit of that spag moss that I have and I'm gonna flatten it out like this. Okay. I'm gonna take very carefully the root structure of the Elaine with the soil and I'm just gonna fold over the spag. Now what this is gonna do is encapsulate the roots with a little bit more humidity so that way it can handle these drier periods, okay, that this tank is gonna have. And then I'm gonna put this right here, right like that. Oh, that looks beautiful. Okay, my calcium bowl right there. Okay, I'm gonna put this bad boy right here. Love the earth stars. Love, love, love the earth stars. Okay, I got another really beautiful aloe right here and this one actually flowers. As you can see, I wish we could have got one that was blooming, but I don't think we have any currently that are blooming. So take this. You can see their, their, their root systems are very simple. Okay, but well, what's important is you wanna make sure that all the root systems are completely covered. So I know my water bowl fits perfectly right there. So I am gonna put this, I feel comfortable enough to put this right here that I can have my water bowl here, but not disturb the plant while making sure its roots get what we need to survive. Look at that. Okay. All right. All right, next I have another earth star right here. All right. Let me see the scissors. This is bugging me. This is another trick. If you don't like the size of the palm fronds, just cut them with scissors. Really easy. Okay. There's a lot of cool options here. So I think, so this needs to be open here. This needs to be open here. All right. So remember how I told you about the, the earth stars? Well, they can grow a couple different ways as well. They don't technically have to be planted in the soil. And I'm gonna show this to you and I'll be sure to do my best to let you guys know how, how it maintains. We're gonna be selling this enclosure at our point of sale. Um, but you know, if you, if you come to our point of sale, you're likely come back. So you can always keep us updated with how that is and I can let you guys know. So same thing, I'm gonna take this bag here and I'm just gonna kinda encapsulate the root base like so. If you're really concerned, you could even use fishing wire to kinda keep that where it's at. And then there's this little top hole right here that barely holds anything. Oh, actually I want that right here. Now, to maintain this, all you need to do is make sure that this never completely gets bone dry for more than three days. As long as that spag moss does not get bone dry for more than three days, you will not have a problem. Okay, so we got two really beautiful earth stars here. We have a hedgehog aloe here and a pontia, another aloe. You know, I really like this small plant right here, but we still need something that's gonna pop, pop a little bit. And I think, honestly, I think if I put this, if I put this right here, Yep, that's what we're gonna do. So I got a really nice succulent. Now we do ship succulents like the other plants and we do our best to package them to make sure that they don't get damaged. So the thing with succulents is a couple things. Number one, their root systems, you notice how I didn't take all this dirt off? Their root systems are very delicate. Not to mention their root systems are delicate. Their, uh, their petals themselves are pretty delicate. So we take every precaution that we can to make sure that we're getting your succulents to you exactly the way uh, that they left our warehouse with our packaging. We're not perfect, but we're really working hard to 
make sure that what you get is what is advertised. Okay, so I really like this so far. Our, our, our little one has a lot of opportunities here. We have a cave right here that we can easily get in and out of that has an entrance here, entrance here, entrance here, as well as a little bit of humidity that's gonna be coming from this plant pushing down in. And then we have our humid hides connected to our hot right over here. We have enough soil in here uh, to, to, to maintain us and to keep us happy and healthy. Uh, the only other thing that I could say that I might want that is not in there is I really can't think of anything. Um, I like, the, for leopard geckos, they're, it's not that they can't climb, but they don't have the lamella on their fingers, so they're their claws. So I try to make it as accessible to them as possible. So this is the trick I was talking about. This is a small piece of cork bark. What I like to do is I'll take a piece like this and I'll put it in the water bowl and it's going to float. What that's going to do is prevent feeders from drowning in the water. So I, I, grab, I grabbed an air plant. Air plants do great in leopard gecko setups. All you need to do is directly miss them every couple days. And I'm actually, as much as I would love to put this right here, I'm not able to do so because the hot spot is going to be right there. So it would, it would literally get cooked. What I am going to do is I'm going to put it and tuck it in right. Uh, I guess I could go right there. That's going to be a little tight. Oh, perfect. Boom. I like that there. I think that looks pretty neat and it's a little bit different than, than, than what we were doing before. Okay. So, Cover it one more time. We got the 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 Terra Sahara. We got the different biodegradables mixed in with your biological drivers, as well as all of our decor. Next is adding our cleanup crew. So first we have are some springtails in here. So this is a very very small amount of springtails. Um, we're going to be putting in a lot more. I just I really wanted you guys to see that they're on the charcoal. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put them right back here. And since we have the calcium in there, that should help. And then where I put the springs, taking a tiny little bit of spag on top of that charcoal, I'm just going to cover that charcoal up and just kind of cover it with soil. Here we go. Okay. Over here, we have a good amount of different types of isopods. So we have some oranges, some, some, uh, some blues, as well as some dwarf purples. We've got a whole bunch of stuff in here. So let me find some of those purples. Ah, there they are. Okay. So, oh, I'm using two different types of isopods. Yes, I am. So the dwarf purples are going to be centralized here. They're going to be centralized under the water bowl and in the middle layer and the bottom layer. They're going to effectively help your soil aerate as well as break down your organic masses. And where we mixed in that, those palm fronds deep in the substrate, they're going to become a microbial hotspot for these smaller isopods to breed more readily. Then we have our top layer isopods, which is right here which is the proscenuses. So these are the oranges and the blues. Um, you know, for me and house, I just kind of mix them together for me. It works out all really well. And as you can see, uh, I put a good amount of adults in here. Okay. So we added in our springtails and isopods. Next, I kind of want to go over the husbandry that husbandry that we're using as well as impaction so really quick on impaction we i will always recommend bioactive substrate for healthy animals or uh, and animals that aren't having any sort of Im immunocompromisation it's when their bodies aren't uh, aren't appropriately functioning because of something suppressing their immune system that they something that they would normally be able to pass like ingesting some substrate for example that their bodies are unable to do so because they're in a weakened state. And essentially, as long as your animal is healthy uh, and doesn't have you know, a ton of parasites and things like that, you should have no problem having them be in a bioactive terrarium. For leopard geckos, I, re I, you can, I recommend when they're first born, like out of the egg, you keep them in a more 
applicable setup uh, until they're eating on their own and X, Y, and Z. But I've kept leopard geckos as young as 45 days on this on the substrate with great success. Uh, but again, I also know what I'm doing. So it's one of those things like, you know, you could always wait until we are about three months old and then introduce in there depending on where you're getting them or if you produce them yourself. So, as, and then as far as feeding is concerned, we feed a variety to our leopard geckos. Uh, we like to feed crickets that are gut loaded with my bug grub. So I, I can't wait to show you guys my all new packaging for this that's coming out. All of my substrates now have, or excuse me, all of my diets now have a guaranteed analysis backed by the FDA and an, an ingredient list, as well as all the other good stuff on there with much better packaging and better pricing. So I'm really excited about that. But just to kind of show you guys here, uh, we here's the bug rub that I just put some crickets in a bin so you guys can see. So this is how we gut load our crickets. Um, we there's there's a lot in here. We're going to be taking this ball of bug rub and putting it into the master cricket bin. But essentially, a couple about four to six hours before we feed our leopard gecko, we always make sure that they're gut loaded appropriately. If you're not sure what gut loading is, feel free to check out my other video about uh, bug rub and that goes over to how that works. Uh, and then for the crickets, you never want to go with a space bigger between their eyes. So a good rule of thumb when looking at feeder insects such as soft bodied roaches and worms, the space in between their eyes right here is the largest prey, prey item that is recommended to feed them. Okay, that's a pretty general, general rule of thumb for these guys. There you go. Now, for the daytime, we will be running a couple things. So number one, during the day, we have my Glow & Grow LED light. This is my 22-inch version. And again, we just finally got these back in stock after being sold out for like six months. It hurt my soul very much. And they are on top of my LED props, okay? Uh, next, I highly recommend, this is Arcadia's Shade Dweller UVB. This is only a 12 inch light. So it's recommended to have your heat lamp be right here. So I'm gonna be putting the heat lamp right here, like this, okay? So that way the heat is centralized right here. Right next to the heat lamp, going this way, that the bulb is going to be about 12 inches away or 12, uh, two inches away from the heat dome is going to be the UVB bulb. So during the daytime, we are going to be using a 50 watt deep heat projector. Okay, I really like the deep heat projectors because they give out infrared A and infrared B, which is very, very important, just like the halogens do. Uh, but this has a really good uh, cutaneous. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? This, this bulb is extremely effective by going in through their skin, through the cutaneous layer, and actually hitting their musculoskeletal system, which is, ex which is a big reason, uh, big reason, which is how they thermoregulate in the first place. When you are using like infrared C, like ceramic heat emitters, it doesn't go down deep into the cutaneous tissue as compared to like a deep heat projector, which is what makes these bulbs so good. And then we uh, another option is a halogen. So we're starting off with a 50. Uh, like I said, we're going to have the hottest as a 95 for, for me. That's always where I've kept them. But it's going to average probably around between 92 and 94. So it's going to be one of these two bulbs that are on during the day. Also during the day, we're going to be running a UVB. This is a, you know, like I said, this is not a high Ferguson zone. This is for animals that get exposed to just a little bit of UVB, but it is still recommended to them because reptiles are powered by the sun. So it's important that we, rec that we uh, mimic that as closely as possible. And then the glow and grow. So this, all of this is gonna be on during the day. It, uh, we are also going to have our glow light specifically plugged into a thermostat. Now, it's very important that you look at your bulb when using a thermostat, because if the thermostat is turning the bulb on and off, on and off, on and off, some bulbs can't handle that. So you really want to make sure that you're looking at the quality and the brand of your bulb with how they work with the thermostats. But Exoterra makes a really good budget thermostat handles up to 300 watts it's it's uh it, it it has a dimmer in it you know it's it's and and of course it makes you safe 
uh, so and provide provo proper temperature to your leopard gecko. So the glow light's going to be hooked up to the thermostat to have that high of where we want it. And then as a backup, we'll be using our thermometer hygrometer placed throughout the enclosure to make sure we are getting the accurate re measurements that we want. We are going to let this tank cycle for, I would say, you know, a couple weeks until we actually have uh, really healthy springtail populations and stuff before, like, we put an animal in here. But I am going to put the leopard gecko in here just so I can show you guys. Uh, and, of course, to get him, get footage of how happy he is. So as far as supplements are concerned, there's a lot out there. Since we are providing UVB, you do not want to provide calcium with D3 because your uh, gecko's body will automatically produce the vitamin D3 for musculoskeletal strength and uh, breeding strength, all that stuff, with UVB, uh, with UVB being provided. If you don't provide UVB, you must provide a calcium with D3. Again, if you do not use a UVB bulb, you must use a calcium with D3. And then for a multivitamin, we highly recommend a multivitamin that does not have D3 in it. Uh, and that is the, the Herptivite, uh, which is, again, really, really, this, this brand's been around forever. Uh, Rapashi makes a good one called, uh, 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 it's called Supervite, which is a really good multivitamin as well. Arcadia makes excellent supplements as well, if you guys can get your hands on them. Honestly, if I could have the Arcadia supplements here, that's what I would, but I haven't been able to ascertain them just yet. And we feed babies um, every day. Uh, after they get past about four months, we go to every other day. And once they get about, you know, uh, eight months, or sorry, six months to a year, it's about every two days. Then after they're adults, about twice a week, the three times a week, because obesity is a common problem with these guys. So overall, I'm really happy with how this turned out. And I really hope that whoever gets this tank is, is, is going to love, love it and uses it for their leopard gecko. For an adult, you could, you could realistically keep two females in here uh, with no problem. Just make sure that they don't fight, you know, different, t different territories. Uh, if you're going to keep a pair in here, you can let them lay their eggs in here, and you shouldn't have a problem just letting the eggs incubate in here as long as the parents are good with not disturbing them. Uh, but again, if you're going to keep a pair together, you really just got to watch. Uh, this isn't a breeding video, though. This is a husbandry video. And like other geckos, you don't want to keep two males together. Hey, dude. Here. There you go. Go on in. There you go. Let's get you some fresh. You know what? Maybe we'll just keep him in here and just add in more bugs. So that way he can. And then what I've been doing, guys, I found this to be really helpful. After I get my, get, after I get my plants in here, I just give all my plants a nice little watering. And you can expect your... You can expect the humidity to be a little bit higher when first setting it up with the Terra Sahara. But again, you want the top layer to be dry and the middle and bottom layers to be moist, but no water pooling at the bottom. And as far as what we feed this little guy, I apologize, I only said crickets. We also offered soft-bodied roaches small silkworms, small horn worms, and as well as uh, occasionally munches on an isopod when we can get our little hands on them. As far as a feeding dish, there's a lot of different options out there for you. Uh, you just got to kind of look and see what's best for you. You can also train them for tong feeding, which is a really neat little thing. Hey, dude. Oh, you're so cute. Uh, but again, guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I apologize I haven't been able to do as many. My life has really turned into managing BioDude instead of actually getting to play with the animals as much, which is a challenge for me, but it's my job. But I really appreciate everybody's support, especially this first quarter. It's, it's been tough, but we are coming through with flying colors. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of, my, all of my staff and all of my supporters. So again, my name is Josh Halter. I'm the owner and founder of the BioDude. You can come see this tank and you can come visit my store here Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And check me out on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Instagram, all that good stuff. The dude abides.
So I have my 22 inch LED, finally got them back in stock. We, I placed my order for these in November and it's the end of April.